Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to It's Time. We appreciate you coming. I have a special, special guest. We do. Yes. Both of us. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's right. We, we've been married so long. I when know. I, when I speak, it's like, it's us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but this is Reverend Frank Pavone, serves as the president of the National Pro-Life Religious Council and as the national pastoral director mm -hmm. of Rachel's Vineyard, the world's largest ministry of healing after abortion. He is the national director of Priests for Life, the largest Catholic pro-life organization in the world. Wow. Uh, he has received many awards, pro-life awards by the National Right to Life Committee and numerous other pro-life awards and honorary doctorates. What an honor. Yeah. Herman, thank you. Good to be with you. Sharon, God bless you. God bless you. How many you. miles do you fly annually? That, well, you know, that's a good if question. Ever, I'm, on, I'm on the, uh, the highest echelons in all the airlines. I, you know, <laughs> sometimes the pilots recognize me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I can probably fly the planes if I had to. But, uh, no, I, I travel to about four states every week. Uh, on this mission every and, uh, week every week and I've been doing it since 1993 on a full-time wow. basis um, interacting with the pro-life movement in every dimension on every level and I, I never get tired of it it's a it's a joyful joyful ministry I, I have to uh, I shared with in the green room with Reverend Pavone uh, some of the things that I've done been arrested for for blocking a clinic along with my son because he, yeah. he he said that was the, the greatest experience spiritually he told me I've ever had dad mm -hmm. so it was really and so we were thrown into this this holding area where we were kept for many hours even into the night and fed uh, bologna and and uh, sandwiches and they're pretty good by the way yeah. and, <laughs> and it's amazing when, while I'm sitting there eating this person sitting next to me I said, share with me why, why you're going through this. Mm. I know why I'm doing it. Mm. And the person said, well, he said, first of all, uh, when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, mm -hmm. through his shed blood, his grace and mercy, how can I do less than try to save lives that he has created? So he goes on with his testimony. Mm. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, it must be a Baptist, <laughs> must be a Presbyterian, must be a Methodist. Pentecostal. I said, well, where do you go to church? And he told me, cathedral, so and so. And I said, you're a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, yes. I, I mean, his testimony was so solid. Right, that, right, right. That if somebody said, can you give a testimony? I'd go, whatever he said. There that's you go. me. <laughs> but isn't it interesting? Yep. We were talking about that just moments ago, how, how this organization because you're headed for Washington DC that's right that's right how this organization has brought faith together but God bless the Catholics for keeping it in the forefront yes yes well it, it, it's a joy to do it and as you say you know the effort to defend life I believe in our day is the most practical and successful forum for bringing Christians together from all parts of the body of Christ uh, in fact this national pro-life religious council that I lead is precisely for that purpose, to bring disciples of Jesus Christ together from wherever they are denominationally and to say, you know what, there's something we all agree on, that God became human in Jesus Christ, that he's the only Lord and Savior, that he conquered death yes. by his resurrection yes. and that he's coming back. Yes. And by, before he comes back, we need to be ready and prepare yes. the way. And one of the basic ways we do that is to defend the lives that he made. Amen. Yeah. I've got to show, I just received my, and in fact, I'm not, promoting this, but it's a great magazine, it's a world magazine, and it talks about it's not personal, it's strategically, strictly, strictly it's rather, business. business, and that's exactly what the abortion, now, now take a look on that screen, I don't know if you can see it because it's, it's kind of small, but it's got depicted this certain areas of what they sell, uh, the, the brain area, uh, the certain areas of the, the tissues, the liver, all of these different prices. And that's what Planned Parenthood, that's what they do. That's right. And you know what absolutely, I guess it infuriated a lot of people, that it was on the news 
basically Fox News. Mm -hmm. No other channel led with it, mm -hmm. their nightly news, and it just kind of went away. But yet, do you remember the dentist that shot that lion you in Africa? That's right. They were, they were protesting at his house with signs, mm -hmm. wanting, wanting the guy to be done away with, to put into prison for life, and that was on all of the networks for weeks. There is such a blind spot to the unborn child. There is such a distortion, uh, and and I think some of this, the, some of this uh, e excitement we have over, you know, the deaths of animals and so forth. It, w I think we're trying to compensate psychologically ah, right. for for what we know is our guilt for ignoring the violence against the children in the womb. Oh, you're right. You're, I, I'm going to jump to chapter three. Great book, by the way. Get your copy. The availability will be on your screen, where you can go to that website, find out. Uh, his his schedule, I didn't keep up with him. He, he might be in your area that you're watching, because this is national, yes. so he might be in your area, but he's headed for Washington, D.C. to be the big pro-life. You're going to speak there? Yes, yes, the March and, for Life. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's now I'm going to jump to chapter three, sure. time for repentance. What are you saying? I say, you know, people ask, what is the first thing we have to do? What's our first duty spiritually in regard to abortion? And many people will say, well, it's to pray. But I say, no, it's to repent. Repentance is first. We all have to repent of abortion. It's not just the mother who went to the clinic or the, or the, or the abortionist that went in and tore that baby apart. How about all the people of God? Because Scripture tells us when, 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 when innocent blood is shed on the land, everyone on the land has to answer for it. Mm -hmm. When the first murder took place and, and, and Cain killed his brother Abel, Scripture tells us Abel's blood spoke. It cried out from the ground. Now, if if a, a, over a million babies in the United States alone are being killed by abortion every day, what kind of sound must God hear from the blood crying out from the ground? And who has to answer that cry? We do. Now, I, I, I often think of, uh, uh, as you know, in Deuteronomy, in the 21st chapter, there's a fascinating uh, passage there where God tells his people that if they find a corpse slain in the land, they have to, they have to come together. And they actually had to have a ritual of asking forgiveness of God for the, the killing of that person, even if they didn't know who did it or how it happened. In fact, the prayer says, Lord, you know, our, our hands did not shed this blood, our eyes did not see this deed. But then it goes on to say, but Lord, forgive us the guilt of innocent blood. So God is asking them to, to ask forgiveness for a sin they didn't even commit. And the reality there spiritually is, wait a minute, we're all united. If, if, if somebody is killed, I may not know their name, I might not have seen their face, and I might not know how they got killed, but one thing I do know, that's my brother, that's my sister. When it comes to the abortion issue, most people agree that abortion is wrong. But the problem is they think it's none of their business. Right. They say, oh, well, this is somebody else's choice, somebody else's child. And what we say, what you and I say, who are followers of Jesus Christ, believers in the Word of God, we say, wait a minute, God made all of us and He entrusted us to the care of one another. So if somebody's having an abortion today, that child is my brother, my sister. Wow. I need to speak up for that. Not because I'm trying to interfere in somebody's life or take away their freedom, but simply because I'm trying to speak up for the brother or the sister that God gave me. Isn't it amazing how desensitized we have become Yes. When you can see the videos yes. of the undercover individuals yes. that went, had the courage to interview these people and see their heart, which was none. That's right. It's amazing. And talk about butchering human beings that they have gotten to the place where actually it would be a greater outcry had they been caught butchering a dog. A dog, exactly. Exactly. It, it, I mean, the nation would have said, where do they live? We want to protest where they are. We'll go to that place. We'll go to that place <laughs> and make sure well, they never do this again. And, and you know, and see, this is the problem. You, you, you hit it on the head, the desensitization. We work at, at, at our organization, the Priests for Life, with, with a lot of former abortionists. And we also do some of this undercover work, too. And so we interact with these people all the time. And they have, just like they have dehumanized the child, they'll say, well, this is not a person. This is just tissue. This is just a parasite. They'll use all these, these dehumanizing terms. And we need to use it so that we can help others. So we can is help others. They try to justify yes. it, right. Um, but in the process of doing this, they dehumanize themselves. 
And, and they admit to us, because then we bring them to the Lord, we bring them to the Word, we bring them to healing. And as they experience and encounter the truth that is in Jesus, as they begin to come out of that blindness, what they say is, I can't believe how I lied to myself. And, and because they say, they, they say that, that like the first abortion they did, they said, well, it hurt. It really hurt. It was like a hot poker. Says, but then I did another one and it hurt a little less. And then I did a third one and it hurt a little less. And what they were doing was they were stilling the voice of protest yes. within them. Yeah. You put layer upon layer over that and after a while you don't know who you are. You have this in the book in, yes. in, in, a, in a great way, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Oh, Tell yes. his story. Oh, Nathanson was one of the founders of the abortion industry in America. They were. Uh, yes. And uh, he became a friend of mine because he, he was both, both of us from New York. And uh, Dr. Nathanson, through science, began to realize that the unborn child is one of us and should not be killed. And he, he therefore eventually turned against the very act, abortion, which he had unleashed on America. It says in uh, your books he, had, he was responsible for 75,000 abortions. Unbelievable, yes. So you'd wonder, uh, how does this guy ever change? And you know what he did? He even aborted his own child, did the procedure that killed his own child. Oh and he goodness. says in his book, and I, and I mention it in mine, that after doing that, he, 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 he writes, you know, you reader might ask me, how did I feel? Certainly I must have felt some regret, some remorse. And he said, I tell you honestly, I did not. I only Isn't felt the satisfaction of a, of a job well done. This is the dehumanization. And yet, he repented. Now, and like I say, he turned based on science to yes, pro-life, yes. but then he found the Lord. He found the Lord Jesus and he repented. And days before he died, I went to visit him in his New York apartment. Good for you. He could hardly talk. I had to put my ear right up to his face to hear him. But you know what the first thing was that he said? He said, Father Frank, how goes the crusade? My, my. To his last days, oh, the, what was uppermost on his mind was, there are people out there trying to reverse the evil that I unleashed. God bless them. I am with them in spirit. And that should give us all encouragement to keep fighting this evil of abortion. Isn't it amazing how we turn the people that did the video in Planned Parenthood? Yes. That they were the offenders. The offenders, right. <laughs> and the media, especially MSNBC, mm -hmm. picks up on it mm -hmm. and they're trying to go after, they ought to be sued, they're, they're tampering with the video. I mean, it's amazing yes. how evil turns everything and of course the viewers out there yes. that are totally unaware right. that they're using this uh, as their defense right. start to accept it. Well, there's a massive denial going on, and as you know, I trace this in this book, Abolishing Abortion, and, and I point out how, you know what the, the, the defenders of abortion and the kind of people that were caught in these videos doing these evil things, you know what's the last thing they want to talk about? Abortion. Oh, yes. The ones who are selling it, the ones who are doing that's it, why the ones say, who are advocating. That's what we're doing for the, for the female. That's we're right. We're keeping them from c cervical cancer, yep. breast cancer, and then it was found out they don't even do mammograms. They, they want to talk about everything yeah. except abortion. Yeah. And, and that's why one of the best things we can ask people, whether it's a relative, a friend, a coworker, uh, anyone we're talking to about this subject, especially if they disagree with us, one of the best questions to ask them is, okay, have you ever seen an abortion? Or can you give me a description of what it is? Right. Because before we argue about whether it's right or wrong, whether it should be legal or illegal, we have to get to what is it yeah. and I expose wanted, it. I wanted to ask you too, you know, since you're dealing with this every day of your life. Yes. Do you see a, a, a difference in the uh, feelings of the younger people coming up? Yes, and I'll tell you what one of the main differences is. If, you, if people ask us, you know, why are we into pro-life, we tell them we want to defend these babies, like we've already said on this, on this program. You ask these young people now that are coming up into the movement, why are they defending the babies? And they have a somewhat different perspective. They say, it could have been me. Really? You see, they understand that when they were yes. in the womb, unlike us, when they were in the womb, they were not protected. 
They were not considered persons. So the legality of abortion for them is a personal insult, a personal affront. Mm -hmm. And it's psychologically devastating. In fact, psychiatrists wow. have begun to study what's called abortion survivor syndrome. What does it do to our young people? And this is so important for parents, clergy, youth ministers to begin to understand, educators, that these young people are growing up in a society that told them from the beginning you could have been you could have been thrown away you could have been disposed of killed and it would have been legal and and this is like now this is devastating to them and they realize also that they've lost brothers and sisters to abortion many of them you know have lost I never thought sibling. about that mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and so what does this do to our young people? yes it's, it's really you have in a book uh, Phil Klein he's a yes. former Kansas Attorney General and they file criminal charges against George Teller and 107 charges against Planned Parenthood. Where is that today? Well, Phil and, and I actually work together uh, on uh, continuing to find ways to bring the abortion industry to account for its actions. I'm glad you say um, industry. Yes, it's an industry. It's a business, like, like that yeah. article points yeah. out. But you know, uh, I brought Phil into my book for this reason, that this is a man that illustrates the kind of sacrifice I believe we need to make now uh, as a society, in our all in our various professions, we need to be willing to sacrifice for these children, as you yourselves have done, and as you were relating at the outset. Uh, that 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 the problem again is not that we don't realize this is wrong, but that we 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 count the cost too much. And you know, the businessman will say, "Well, I'm going to lose business." The pastor and the preacher will say, "Well, I'm going to lose members of the congregation." Uh, 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 people will make all kinds of reasons why it's not safe for them to come out strongly against abortion, strongly in favor of the unborn. Phil Klein is the kind of man who put his professional life on the line and he paid the price. He, he got, he got his, his license taken away. He got you know, uh, uh, punished in all kinds of ways, not for doing anything wrong, but for doing everything right. And, and this is the price we pay as, yeah, as Christians. It, it, it's, a, it's a family thing with us because our son-in-law, uh, Dr. David yeah, Anderson, we, really we do a big. program mm -hmm. here together, mm -hmm. and he was, he had a church in Buffalo, New York, and his close friends, the Shanks. And I know them yes, well. Oh yeah, Paul that, and that's Rob. his buddies. Yeah. And and uh, David was our son-in-law was arrested nine times, so mm -hmm. he finally went before the judge and the whole thing, and the judge told him, if you go back to your church on this Sunday, and you read anything pertaining to the subject of abortion, mm -hmm. you will be arrested. Mm -hmm. So David, our son-in-law, goes, watch. Yeah, <laughs> so on that Sunday, him. the cameras were there, the news media was there, and he preached a sermon. And later on, the judge that made that statement, mm -hmm. I mean, it was actually printed, the statement, recanted what he said. Uh -huh. So in other words, he was going to tell the preacher yes. what he could preach. Yeah, this is, this is an outrage. You know, yeah. This is an outrage. This is a country built on religious freedom, and uh, we cannot let the government censor the Word yeah. of God yeah. in the pulpit. That's right. Um, Dr. Alvita King. Yeah, just going to bring her yeah, up. She, yes. she is a close friend of yours. Yes, and she works on our, our team. At share the share how your relationship is. Dr. King uh, speaks about abortion, and I met her in the late 90s, and uh, she heard me, we were both speaking at the same conference, she heard me quoting her uncle, Martin, yes. and I heard her <laughs> talking about pro-life. And so we started working together, and uh, after a few years, you know, she said, you know, Father, she said, I, I, uh, I, I, I need, we need to work more closely, she said, because I've had an abortion myself. She's had two abortions. Right. And we have our Silent No More campaign where the, wow. those that have had abortions and found Christ and repented speak out about their experience. So she joined that campaign. And then I said, well, we need to work together. You know, uh, 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 and we brought her on our, on, our, on our team. And we marched together at this March for Life. And I said, does this remind you of the, the marches with your uncle in the civil rights movement? Absolutely. And she said to me, this is the civil rights movement. Because the civil rights movement was not just about dignity for the, the black man. It was about dignity for every human life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, defending blacks against segregation was a corollary of a more fundamental and universal truth, the, the dignity of every human life, and therefore, fighting against abortion is a corollary of the very same principle. So both movements are on the same foundation. Mm -hmm. And that's that. why Alveda works so closely now with us, activating the black community to end abortion. Well, the, the lady that began Planned Parenthood 
Yes. She actually went after the black community. Explicitly. She, she admits it in her writings. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's like they're touting even her. That's right. That to make her out to be a, uh, some kind of heroine. Yeah, really. You know, when in reality, uh, she, she's embracing philosophies that are barbaric. Uh, you know, it's, it's got to it's stop. Even to uh, this day, the abortions, right. for, the, for the large part, mm -hmm. are from the black community. Well, that's right. You know, they constitute 12, 13% yes. of, the, of the population, and yet bear a, a, the brunt of some 35% of the abortions. It's, it's out of all proportion. And we have clear evidence that the abortion industry targets these black communities. Can, can you share in your book, page 73, I just got to highlight it, but I just thought that was excellent. The gospel. Yes. The gospel is a gospel of freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, Galatians 5.1. The Christian is at the service of a heavenly kingdom that embodies the essence of freedom. I have come to proclaim liberty to the captives. Let the oppressed go free, Jesus said, in defining his mission. Wow. And so we've got the oppressed yes. who are the children in the womb. And, and, and that's why, you know, this is so beautiful because the gospel is about freedom. And look how the enemy twists it and they look at us and they say, you're trying to take away people's freedom. Mm -hmm. No, 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 we're trying to give them freedom. You know, some of the pro-abortion leaders will say to us, oh, you, you just want to put women in prison that have abortions. No, 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 we want to take them out of prison. If they've had an abortion, they're in prison already. Mm -hmm. We want to free them from that, that guilt, that despair. This is not pe take, about taking people's rights away. It's about taking away their despair. I know there's no way you can do it, but, but you know, it was always before abortion, they had to go to a back alley mm -hmm. to yes. have an abortion mm -hmm. w with, a, with a hanger or whatever they could use. And many of them died. But yet there are no records in Planned Parenthood about how many died. They're still dying. They're, they're still dying. Right. And if you were to say, okay, abortion never happened. Mm -hmm. How many died as a result of giving themselves their own abortion? Mm -hmm. And then you spin that forward. You can't do this and say, okay, how many have died because it's legal? Mm -hmm. No, there, that's There right. would probably be less. No, we have, we have clear evidence, and sometimes it makes uh, the news, and for in fact, where I grew up in Westchester County in New York, uh, not that long ago, Jennifer Morbelli, a young woman who went to get a so-called safe and legal abortion, ended up dying as a result of the abortionist's uh, malpractice, and, uh, and this is happening every day. The other side tries to cover this up. They don't keep, they, they forge the, the medical records, they change the books, they keep it secret, they cover their tracks, um, but the more you dig, the more you find, and this is one of the things I also bring out in the book. We just have to shine the spotlight, not only on what abortion is, but on how corrupt the abortion industry is. It's the most unregulated surgical industry in the country. And you always see when we try to pass laws in states that say common sense things, like that most people presume are in place already, like, oh, you have to have emergency medical equipment in the facility, or the person who administers anesthesia, maybe they ought to be trained in anesthesiology. These are things people presume. So none of that is required. It's not required. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when we try to introduce changes on the state level to make these common sense standards required, guess who opposes us? Mm -hmm. The pro-choice groups yes. that, this, that claim they're serving women, mm -hmm. and then, well, then why don't you want them to be safe when they go to these clinics? Isn't it a, sh isn't it a shame <laughs> that the Democrats back Planned Parenthood? Yes, it is. Because they get millions when they're, right now, while they're running for political That's office. exactly right. And they don't want to mess with that. So we, that pay taxes, yes. are making it possible it, 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 it's, it's an outrage, and you know Congress has held hearings and will continue to do so, and we're working closely with them on this, uh, to continue to investigate Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. But on these committees, the Democratic members, they cannot bring themselves to voice one ounce of outrage mm -hmm. over the killing of these babies, the, the, the trading of their body parts. They can't bring themselves to oppose that. All they can do, as you mentioned before, is, is turn their anger towards their Republican colleagues yes. or the pro-life activists. Yes. Yes. What, what's the matter with these people? Even when it comes to partial birth yes. abortion. Yes. I mean, yes. W even if that were just the one issue, wouldn't you think they would say, 
I am definitely against that. Well, you know, and they are so out of step with the American people because a, 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 among people, even those who call themselves pro-choice, even those who say, you know, I don't want Roe v. Wade overturned, I don't want to see abortion illegal, even those people, if you ask them, well, okay, but there is a limit somewhere, isn't there? Many of them will say, well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if someone wants to get an abortion, she should get it in the first few weeks of the pregnancy. Okay, well, how about in the fifth or sixth month of pregnancy? Oh, no, 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 it shouldn't be allowed. Well, the fact is, it is allowed. Sure. It's allowed right now throughout pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things, and I trace this in my book, too, yes. is one of the things we need to do right now is, of course, every abortion is wrong. Every baby needs to be protected. But strategically and pedagogically, if we can focus people on the late-term abortions and say, were you aware that babies who are, are in, the, in the sixth, seventh, eighth month of pregnancy are being aborted, can we at least stop that? and then work ourselves back and ultimately protect them all. But people will, they, they start to wake up. Can you imagine the hypocrisy? They send Gus now, the guy, yes. the guy in, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. Two life sentences. That's right. And what he was doing is doing as we sit right now all over the country. I, I, I was in the courtroom during that Gosnell trial, uh, and we had, we, in fact, Alveda King it was in the black pro-life leaders were very much involved in exposing that whole thing, and so we were uh, there in the trial and everything, and it was just, just amazing how, first of all, so many media ignored it. Yes. Same thing oh, as yes. with these videos. Sure. And then secondly, how, you know, you're sitting in a courtroom and the argument is not over whether or not he killed a baby. Everybody in there knew he killed a baby. The argument was, well, was the baby alive uh, uh, oh, after birth, or, or, or did you kill the baby after birth or before birth? It's like if, if it were a court trial saying, well, sir, did you kill your wife in the house or out on the street? It's like, <laughs> is that the issue, or is it the issue that there shouldn't be the killing in the first place? Exactly. Hypocrisy. Can you just close yes. with a word of prayer? And yes. Dave, you can take us on out. He's just gonna close this whole program Pray for America. Yes, let's do that. Lord, bless your people. Bless those, Lord, who are babies in the womb. Protect them with your love and mercy. Bless, Lord, those who feel they have to have an abortion. Lift them out of despair and let them know we love them. Bless those who have had an abortion. Give them healing and peace that comes only in the blood of Jesus. And Lord, bless us, your people, your disciples. May we be the voice of the voiceless as your word commands us to be. And may we see the saving of life because, Lord, you have come that we may have life and have it abundantly. Yes. Bless our leaders that they may know that their duty is to protect human rights, not to take them away. Make our nation, Lord, what you want it to be. Give us a culture of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me share with you, if you've had an abortion, mm. God forgives. Am I right? Absolutely. You can be forgiven. And there are so many testimonies of those that have had an abortion mm -hmm. and they've given it to the Lord and they've confessed it and they've asked for forgiveness and their lives have been supernaturally changed. So don't ever think, I'm a marked person from the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Confess to Him. Ask Him to forgive you and begin your life brand new. And if you're watching this program and considering abortion, ask the Lord, what would you have me do? You're going to get an answer. You're going to hear from Him. Don't take that life. God created it. God bless you in your decision. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.